welcome everybody and we had really nice nice uh, morning with with the uh, keynotes and, and and day and and now we are getting into into the our workshop on on data spaces boosting industrial ai and uh, with me here uh, is um, a group of experts let's start from uh, from uh, who is who is now we are the moderators uh, my name is Tuomo Tuikka. I'm working at VTT Technical Research Center of Finland. And with me here is the, uh, Ed Curry, who is, who is uh, from Insight Center. But uh, we both have uh, a role in, in the Big Data Value Association. We are heading the, or leading the task force of uh, data spaces, the task force number 10. And uh, first, I would like to rem uh, remind uh, uh, some uh, Housekeeping rules uh, that uh, we have to take into account is that all participants is except speakers and moderators will be muted by default. If you're not a speaker, please turn off your video and feel free to post your questions into uh, the, the questions and answers box. And we will be looking at them with Ed and, and we'll come back with, uh, to them in the, in the end of the uh, talks. Now, let's see. The BDVA task force data spaces, uh, task force number 10, uh, is, is, has started uh, this spring and, and has now several subgroups of interest, which are either joint subgroups with uh, other task forces or, or totally new. And these tackle issues we are now identifying as necessary approaches towards data spaces. And uh, this session is, is really interesting because it combines two specific areas of concern in Europe. That is the data spaces and artificial intelligence, uh, which are really in, in focal point of the success of, of European digital economy. Data spaces have uh, risen as a concept, especially last year when the European data strategy nailed the path towards domain-oriented data spaces. And uh, as we have been hearing, we have been witnessing many initiatives and European projects which take a stand what data spaces are and how they function. But uh, then again, I would say dare to say that, that we still are in, in the beginning of this journey. So when uh, Big Data Value Association started to work and conceptualize the data spaces, uh, in 2018, there was really no, no definition available. But um, after many workshops and, and questionnaires, we wrote the first version of white paper called Towards a European Government Data Sharing Spaces. And that was released in May 2019. We then updated the paper with a new version released in November 2020. And, and this paper is very relevant uh, today. What is special in this uh, is that the paper approaches data spaces from a high level vision on what, what the data space can be. European data sharing is, is not only one domain rehearsal, but eventually data space will be a vehicle to start, share data seamlessly across domains and, and borders and create a real European data economy. Hence the concept of European data sharing space. Another achievement of, of the paper is the, the data sharing value wheel, uh, which describes core pillars and principles of the envisioned European Cohen data space, uh, uh, then generating value for all sectors of society. The data wheel shows that, that we need to take into account the core pillars. Trust is in the center of activity and when constructing, constructing data spaces, we need common rules. We need to take into account citizens, the people and fairness in data use. Organizations need a data culture and, and we need to have a well-designed technology and, and of course, high quality data itself. And these are just examples of what to consider. The, the areas really, really uh, multifaceted, I would say. So at the same time, while, while data spaces are evolving, uh, it is a high time now to look at those high impact opportunities emerging from these developments. 
First, there will be wider access to data, which can be used to realize the full potential of AI technology. And second, the European Government Data Space gives us a possibility to assume a prominent position to develop data and AI solution, while at the same time respecting European ethical values. And this is why uh, we today have a group of experts enlightening us their perspectives uh, on, on data spaces and how to boost industrial AI. So here, here you are. The group of experts are uh, Sonia Zilner, Julian Tiaroni, Antonio Kung, Natalie Bertels, Rigo Wenning, Matthias Kuom. And uh, welcome everybody. And it's a really pleasure to have you have you with us today and talking about uh, the uh, data spaces and industrial AI. Now, the agenda goes like this. Uh, first, we look at the real-time linked data spaces, standardization and technological framework for industrial AI, then governance and legal infrastructure, then interoperability, then data spaces for manu manufacturing as, as an example. So as you can see already, there's many good perspectives on, on data spaces and AI coming, coming now in the, in the session. But I, I think that... Uh, we will start with Ed and, and uh, then go forward and, and see, see then uh, and hope that the technology works. So Ed, are you online? I, I sure am, Samo. So I'm going <laughs> to share my screen now. OK, go ahead. That's great. It's going to go full screen here. OK, so th th thank you very much, Tomo, and, and thanks for the, for the great introduction. Um, so today what I'm going to talk about is, is I want to kind of give the big picture of what a data space can do. How can it help us? Um, and then we kind of dive into the, the deep um, analysis that we get from, from, from our, our, our contributors today. So what I want to talk about is, is how data spaces are enabling smart environments or can enable them. So we're all familiar with the notion of a smart environment. And, and, and really, smart environments are about bringing ICT together um, with the physical world to be able to uh, improve its optimization. So whether it's improving the operation of a building, of a water network, of our smart grid, of agriculture, of how our cities operate, um, of how our manufacturing processes run. The key here is all how do we get data that helps us understand this? How can we use AI to drive the digital transformation that we need to optimize these? And the big topic that we have now is digital twins. Everyone is saying we need to create this digital replica of our environment, our physical world that we can analyze. We can take all of these streams of data, all of these sensors, we can observe them, we can um, figure out what's happening in the physical world, and then we can come up with our smart decisions that are driven by AI that we can then bring back to the physical world and change it. So, so these digital twins are, are intimately connected with the need for data and, and the need for AI to be able to make smart and clever decisions. When we look at how these digital twins uh, are built, well, what we need to do is to actually connect a lot of different intelligence systems that are out there. The data-driven intelligence will be dr driven by different types of data, whether it's industrial data, personal data, or open data. And what we can see is that these systems, uh, that the type of data that we're looking from comes from lots of different areas. So it could come from, from, from a connected car, it can come from the, the smart infrastructure that actually surrounds that car, whether it's parking or the road or charging stations. It can come from information providers that are either giving navigational aids to our drivers or providing content to them for their entertainment. It can come from businesses and organizations that are trying to build value added services around that, whether it's usage based insurance, fleet management, et cetera. So there's a lot of data here that needs to be brought together that needs to be connected so we can actually build these holistic digital twins that are required. From an engineering point of view, we know that this data exists out there and lots of different independent systems that have been created for their specific purposes. And in the, the systems engineering community, the community, the software engineering community, they talk about the need to bring together these systems into what they call a systems of systems. How do we bring independent systems together so that they can exchange data, that data can flow between them and that they form a system of systems. And one of the key things that we want to enable here you know, these data value chains that allows data to flow between these different systems. Um, but one of the key barriers that we have is interoperability. Now, while there's been a lot of progress on improving interoperability at the protocol level, so at the networking level and things like 5G to be able to have connectivity, one of the big challenges that we have is interoperability at the semantic level. How do we actually understand what, what data we're trying to use? How do we share that data between the systems? And that really is a key challenge for us. 
we, we don't have today what we would call a standardized data sharing layer that allows us to be able to move data between our different systems. So this is a, a technical slide here, and we have these notions of, of these different layers that exist. We're very good at communication and sensing. We've got lots of standards there. We've got lots of technologies there. We're good at mid building middleware systems that allow us to move data around, publish subscribe systems, service oriented architect architectures, software defined networking. And we're very good at building applications, but what we're missing is this layer that allows us to be able to share data. We, we lack clear principles of how we can share data between our systems. We lack understanding of the legal and the policy constraints that are there. We, we, we don't have any trust in, in, in sharing data between systems. We need to have more, more shared infrastructure. And this is really a challenge that we have when we're trying to build our digital twins, when we're trying to drive digital transformation. And the thing about this is that it's not going to be solved by any one particular thing, that there can be lots of top-down initiatives to be able to try to solve this. And, and we see some of the work by the commission that talks about common European data spaces. We see things like Gaia-X uh, and, uh, and ITSA, but there's also lots of bottom-up approaches as well. And, and we need to look at this mixture of different technologies and designs to be able to understand what's the best way for us to be able to deliver this for, for our society. So what I want to talk about in, in my final few minutes here is one such data space that we created at small scale. This wasn't a large scale project that tried to connect everything together, but rather it was a, a small scale data space trying to enable um, connectivity for digital twins at, at a local level within multiple smart environments. We started building off this notion of data spaces um, going right back in, 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 in the literature to we we'll say around 2006 actually, so it's quite a, an old concept that fundamentally talks about a data space as, as not being a data integration approach. A data space should not be trying to bring together and integrate all your data, but rather it needs to be more about data coexistence. How do we have all of our data out there? How do we make it easier for that data to coexist? How do we bring that data together uh, when we have particular problems that we need to solve or need, 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 need needs data to be able to provide answers to? And this is a, a fundamental change in how we look at the design of a system and the design of the data management approach, data coexistence. The, the goal of the data space that we, we, we created here was to be able to provide base functionality across all of our data sources. We wanted to be able to support all of the different data in its heterogeneous forms. We, we, we basically created the notion of our real-time linked data space and this data space is designed specifically for smart environments to be able to help intelligent systems to share data um, within that environment. We have a couple of, of simple principles for, for this. Um, we want to be able to bring together a pay-as-you-go paradigm of data spaces, which means that you're able to incrementally improve the integration of data in the data space over time. It doesn't all need to be integrated up front. We use technologies such as linked data and knowledge graphs to bring together and to link our data when it's needed. And we build services around the notion of entity-centric querying. These are all quite important requirements that we have from our smart environment. In terms of the principles that we implement, well, we believe that the data space needs to support data in lots of different formats. It needs to ensure that it doesn't subsume any of the, uh, any of the existing systems that are, that are there. Rather, it needs to provide access in the native interfaces. And that's a really important point when we talk about digital sovereignty and, and the need um, to, to have sovereignty over our data. We also need to, one of the trade-offs that we have then is that we have best effort or approximate answers to our data. And fundamentally, we need to be able to provide pathways of trying to improve access to our data over time. So our data space that we have is relatively straightforward. We have our smart environment. Our smart environment has a data space which has this support platform that provides um, services to, to the items that are there. We have our things which are producing lots of streams of data which are interesting to work with. We have lots of other data sources that actually describe the, the entities that we have and the things that we have within our smart environment. And then we basically looked for the linkages that exist between these da different data sources. So if we have a particular building or a particular room within a building, we're looking at what data sources describe that room, what sensors are in that room, how do we connect information between them? And then finally, we build our applications on top of this. The key thing about building these data spaces and what, what we learned is that what's actually critical to the implementation of this are the different support services that are there uh, for, for enabling the data space to be operable. So the notion of having a data catalogs, search and querying services, data discovery services, the ability to be able to uh, integrate humans within our tasks, the ability to be able to look at real time streams of data and be able to actually ask for, give me all of the data about a particular car, or give me all the data about a particular user or a particular business process that we're working with or a particular customer that we're working with. These become very important services to have and designing and building these services so that they're actually um, interoperable and that they work with different types of data is critical. 
And that's where we basically look at our, our pay-as-you-go model. So what we did is we understood that you can have very, very simple services within a data space, and you can have very, very complex and fully formed data spaces as well. So we use the, the five-star model that was uh, um, introduced by Tim Berners-Lee to describe the different levels of interoperability that you can have about your data within these different data spaces. Everything from very, very simple data that could act like a data catalog, right up to full, fully blown semantic integrated data that gives us detailed search query uh, and analysis capabilities. And this pay as you go model allows us to be able to uh, gauge the level of investment that we need for each of our data sources as we bring them into the data space. What we have then is for each of our services, we're able to look at this from a maturity point of view, from very, very simple implementations of these services to very, very complex implementations of these services. So this is nice. This gives us an idea of what the data space is about. But was it any useful? Did it actually work for us? Well, we were able to deploy our data space in five different pilot sites. So we deployed it in Lanati Airport in Milan, a couple of buildings in Galway, uh, a collection of residential houses in Greece, um, and, and a local school. And the purpose of each of these deployments was to be able to use the data space to help us manage water and energy within each of these different smart environments, help the people that are working in those environments to do that. And what you can see is that we have a diverse set of different types of users within these environments. Everything from building management staff, corporate staff who have financial responsibility um, uh, for, for the organization or have responsibility for running the network. But you also have things like families and kids and children, researchers, um, and other types of application developers. All of these have different requirements in terms of the applications that we want to build, different needs that require us to work with our data in different ways. By using our data space, we were able to enable our digital twins because all of our data was available in the data space. Um, and we were able to connect our data when we needed. We were able to follow our, our OODA loop here, which was bringing our data together, using it to, to um, leverage data-driven uh, sorry, AI-driven decisions, and then being able to make changes within the environment. So we were able to enable this OODA loop using our data space to be able to create our digital twins. Based on that, we were able to create, I think, over 60 different types of applications that help the different types of users within the smart environments understand what is the usage of their energy, what is their usage of their water, um, of their water how can they reduce the consumption in general. And we were able to uh, demonstrate a number of different impacts, whether they were environmental impacts by reducing the energy usage or the water usage in the environment to direct monetary savings by um, th that are responsible from the, um, the reduced uh, energy and water consumption. We were also able to help um, um, the operation staff identify long-term leaks that exist within the environments as well by providing data analysis and AI analysis over the data that was in the data space. So this is a good example of how at a small scale, a data space was able to come in and be able to enable a smart environment to, to share data between different systems, to be able to um, empower users, to be able to make decisions, to reduce energy consumption, water consumption, and ultimately to save money as well. Tom, I'll pass it back to you. That's the, the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. And, and really on, on, on time that, that um, in your presentation. So did you see, see in the, in your, in your cases, did you see any uh, cross-sectoral um, data spaces uh, like eventually growing up? So, so what, what we, we didn't see cross-sectoral because what we had was a smart environment. So what we did see was different departments within organizations working together. So bringing together finance um, and the operations team to be able to share their data. We, we, we saw that mm -hmm. effectively they, they, they live in different domains. One is an accounting domain, one is an engineering and an operational domain. And bringing together those worlds um, had challenges because they view the world in very different ways. So by using this kind of pay-as-you-go approach, this incremental approach, rather than trying to get a full understanding of all of those stakeholders at the one time, we were picking specific entities or specific points where we could build understanding and incrementally integrate their data as it went along. So it was a good way of helping them to understand each other and using data to be able to drive that as we moved along. Yeah, and I guess the AI um, portion, I, I saw that there is some machine learning and, and AI also some, some role. And, and how, do you, how, would you, how would you characterize the, the AI's role in, in the future in your cases? Yes, yeah, so, so, so what, what we found is that the AI was uh, incredibly effective for, for analyzing the data once it was there. Mm -hmm. So, so um, the, the techniques that we use were relatively straightforward because what you're looking for is, is opportunities. Sorry, you're looking for for signs of waste. So if energy has been used in a room in the middle of the night, no one's in it, someone's left a light on. If there's constantly water been used at a certain rate in a part of the airport, there could be a leak there because obviously the usage should change over the day. So the techniques themselves were, were relatively straightforward. 
But the key challenge was getting all the data there so that you could actually analyze it in the first place. That's where, where the effort was required. And that's specifically what the data space was trying to, to address was reducing the amount of effort that was required to make that data available. All right, very good. Thank you very much, Ed, for, for this well, for this talk. And, and uh, we, we could go ne next forward. I, I think there is, yes, I don't know how the video works, but uh, uh, we will look at the standardization and technological framework of, for industrial AI. So Julian and, and Sonia, uh, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes. Thank yes. You. Very good. It's your, your turn now. Yeah, we can hear you. I'm just trying to share my screen. Does it work? Yeah, I think it does work. Yeah. Um, so Tumo, thanks for the for the introduction. The presentation will be done by Julian and me. Um, I mean, the title is Overview of Initiatives and Proposed Standardization and Technical Framework. Um, as Ed was just saying that um, you need that based on the data, if you have it, then you can um, um, uh, build nice AI applications. Um, if we are now looking at industrial AI, I mean, this is high quality AI. So we are currently concerned with the question, how to ensure that high, qu high quality standards are fulfilled when AI is developed. And uh, this is also like um, reflecting uh, the new AI regulation, which is putting a lot of future requirements on, on the developing of AI. So we were asking ourselves how we could cluster and prioritize activities or like a strategic activities to ensure that adoption of AI is, is, is speeded up, right? And this is now something we would like to, to introduce here. I think um, the first thing um, is just to make a short recap about what is going on and what we are building upon. This is on the one side on the BDVA, um, um, SRIDA, or like the AI data and robotics uh, SRIDA, where a BDVA has or DIRO has contributed um, with high, high engagement, as well as Julien will introduce um, some of his work from his community. And then we will introduce a joint proposal way forward. Um, what we think that um, at, uh, how we can speed up the implementation of industrial AI. So what are we re uh, related um, European initiatives to the trustworthiness of industrial AI? And I think now I'm presenting here the partnership in AI data and robotics. Um, this graphic should be very familiar to the most of you. I mean, you know that this has been developed over the last two years, more than 500 contributions. And in this framework, we do not have a extra box for trustworthiness um, um, and we do not have uh, for industrial AI because it's cross cutting. Um, we have understood that uh, AI, the core characteristics of AI is trustworthiness because it's central for its acceptance. There might be high, um, high risk application, but you need to have trust for all, um, all AI applications. And important for us is that the trustworthiness is a property of the whole, whole AI system. So that is created by the interaction between technology building blocks. So it needs to be designed into the system. So it needs to be on top of the data spaces. And we need to ensure that we have an end-to-end -end, um, um, process uh, and technology way so that the end-to-end um, um, a characteristic can can be given. Trustworthiness is a lot of different aspects. I mean, reliability, dependability, safety, and, 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 and all these have to be um, displayed by the system during its operation. So basically highlighting here, the, the framework which we have developed is covering um, a, um, a trustworthiness at the core part. And um, it was a big basis of the framework we have developed um, and which will be introduced later. Julien, I think now you can um, introduce um, the Yes, the thank you, Sonia. Uh, yes, we have also some initiative in France regarding the question of uh, trustworthy AI for industry. So uh, the one, it's, uh, it's called Grand Defi and it was launched in uh, 2019. So um, this this program may aim to develop some new approach in order to support the question of uh, AI trustworthiness, but also AI uh, industrialization, especially for uh, critical systems, such as safety critical system, but also business critical system, or, uh, or when, where the, when there are uh, some uh, societal challenges that are related to the system. So the program is divided into three strategic pillars. There is one pillar, which is uh, really focused on uh, the question of technology. So 
how we can uh, support the development and the design of new system using AI with some tests, uh, with some validation, with the question of, so, of, of mentability and uh, everything also regarding the question of uh, acceleration of the process in order to in order to be sure that we implement the specification, but we we, we go fast to from the need to the development of the product. We have a second strategy pillar, which is uh, dedicated on a conformity assessment because it's really key at the end in order to release the product into the market. So we know that there is some new modification with AI introduction into system in terms of evaluation, homologation, or certification. So it's this one is really a, a product and application oriented. And the last one is really dedicated on uh, standardization and normalization. And so we try to develop a, a kind of a global strategy in order to coordinate coordinate some uh, some effort in front in order to support the, the question of uh, AI, uh, industrial AI and uh, trustworthiness AI. If you can go to the next slide, thank you. So it's just to show you one, one example of what we do. For, uh, uh, we will develop in the technological pillar some new method gu guidelines and interoperable tools for supporting all the whole chain of uh, development of product, uh, designing, testing, evaluation, etc., etc. And uh, we try to federate industrial partners such as uh, Airbus, Air Liquide, etc., etc., and also academic partners into one place and one program, which is supported, uh, which is uh, in fact uh, explaining to this orange layer. Uh, what we call a trustworthy AI engineering layer. So the idea is really to, 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 to develop a new way of AI engineering in order to support the question of industrialization and the question of trustworthiness. So of course, we have some collaboration with basic research, with industry, and with all ecosystem in France in order to, uh, in order to achieve this goal. And we have also some phone calls partnership so that's why we we develop this new framework with uh, with uh, with Sonia in order to explain what is for us the key element in order to boost the question of industrialization oh, if next slide uh, it's a non exhaustive view so it's not it's not uh, it's just to show you that there is a many many initiative in uh, in France in uh, Europe in Germany uh, regarding the question of uh, industrialization of AI and industrial AI so we are working on a workshop we have we made two workshop in order to uh, in order to uh, try to figure out all the initiative what are also the key elements the key technical points and uh, the business also uh, uh, related to this question of uh, AI industrialization and AI trustworthiness so it's just to give you uh, an idea of how we manage the construction of this uh, of this uh, framework next slide ah. Okay. So it's yours. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, now it's my turn to, to um, continue. So in the next minutes, we wanted to introduce to you the industrial and trust first AI framework. But before we do, just some um, um, words in terms of making off. And I have to say we are in the middle of the process of making it. So basically, um, as Julia mentioned, is that there have been um, uh, some workshops like a webinar. And we also looked at the existing um, roadmaps which are around and interacted with a lot of now the main was the Franco Franco community but also the German community but also interaction with the BDBA community mm -hmm. and we, we um, um, looked at the existing frameworks and consulted a first um, framework which tries to combine national efforts but also existing European frameworks so that we get a consistent perspective the, the uh, focus content-wise what we are taking is the development and speeding up of the industrial and trustworthy AI. So basically trying to, as Julian was saying, it's like this end-to-end -end engineering which we need to have. So basically how, how can all these building blocks come together and, and set up in a consistent manner and how can we integrate conformity assessment? How can we integrate standardization? And um, the aim is to, to contribute to, to the ambition of BDBA, to Gaia-X, but also other initiatives. And it is now the idea to extend it to other, other initiatives in other countries and also on the European level. So that's in terms of the making of, and you see down here the framework, how it looks like. Um, 
Julia, do you want to continue? Oh, uh, really up to you. So I can I can do it. So we have we have uh, mixed, in fact, the question of the specification. So uh, as you know, there is already some specification at the system level, which is the operational domain specification, the risk and functional specification, and in fact, the EU regulation introduced a new specification, which is uh, the trustworthiness. Uh, so we indicate also a list of characteristics of trustworthiness. So in terms of security, safety, explainability, fairness, etc., and also the question of human centric and what we say is that we need to develop some new methodology and tools in order to uh, handle this question of, uh, of specification uh, boost the development of the system and the product and try to also integrate uh, integrate this new specification into the, the process development in order in order to be sure that the system will do what you have to do and not uh, not uh, another thing uh, we have also indicated that there is a, a layer which is corresponding to the AI-based function, so uh, such as sensing and perception, etc. So, in fact, the, the idea is really to have uh, uh, to have some tools and methods in order to support the, the development of this new sensing, uh, new AI-based function. And after, there is a, the layer which is co corresponding to the application and services, which is a mixed and uh, an integration of the of the different function into one product or one services. Uh, what is really important also for us is the question of the conformity assessment scheme because AI will modify a lot the question of conformity assessment scheme. So we need to develop some new conformity assessment uh, at the system level, uh, at the function level also, and uh, uh, finally uh, uh, have a view of, of the whole application and services in order, to, in order to improve all this development into one product and verify that the development is uh, in line with the standardization and with the regulation. Uh, it's also key to have some strong link with, uh, with the infrastructures. So, for example, with industrial data, data space so, uh, uh, and with BDVA and also with the cloud, uh, cloud and IT infrastructure with GaiaX. So it allows us to have a, a kind of a stacking a view of what is needed in terms of a, a technical and standardization framework to achieve the goal from the data to the application and the services in regard with the question of trustworthiness. We also take into account the question of uh, AGI with the development of new embedded system, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, two uh, aspects that are really important also for us is the question of standardization and the, the question of the re regulatory sandbox sandboxes because uh, as the system are really complex and uh, critical, we need to have some place in order to mix uh, and to combine the view from standardization, the view from the product and the conformity assessment, and the view from the application and services uh, enterprise in order to share this, uh, this, uh, this view together in order to be sure that we have a place to experiment and to develop uh, this approach uh, in regard with the regulation and standardization. If you can go to the next slide. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I, I just... Yeah, uh, if you, add, if you yeah. want to add something, Sonia, yes. Yeah, yeah I wanted to add something um, because I know that a lot of um, BDVA DIRO um, people are on the call and just to highlight, um, you might have seen that we reused a lot of, of um, proposals which have come from the BDVA community in terms, you see, like this regulatory sandbag standardization, you might re re um we cover that, uh, you see here that all the AI-based functionalities are at the core of the technology enabler we have developed, per se. We have here the, the aspect of the data and knowledge, which was also mentioned by Tumo and, and Ed in terms of data spaces discussion. Mm -hmm. We have um, all the explainable AI, robust, safe AI and uh, methodologies and tools, all the aspects are, are there. The boxes have changed. I mean, it's a different way of presenting it and, and uh, to, to highlight the trustworthy aspect, to highlight the speed of industrial engineering and the development of high quality quality AI applications. So mm -hmm. in terms of making of that, um, it is so important that you understand uh, the storyline mm -hmm. here. Um, the next slide, um, mm -hmm. we wanted to finalize how to get engaged. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the point is, as as uh, as we were already saying, this is a bilateral has been up until now a bilateral initiatives, but now we want to open it up, and we want to discuss it with the VDVA community. 
So basically there will be, um, so if you're interested in joining, there will be a um, workshop at the 18th of June where we discuss this positioning paper, where we want to get feedback. Um, the, feed, the, the positioning paper itself will be available as download. And if you want to send us uh, feedback, uh, we also have provided here an email address. And then we have additional activities which will be kickstarted in, in, in September, mm -hmm. what we want, want to put put forward here. Julien, anything which we which we missed what you want to add? No, we 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 you you, you can see that it's uh, at the at the beginning it's a Franco-German position paper, but it's you have to consider this as a nutshell for Europe. So for us it's really important to embed Uh, the, the community in Europe in order to share this view and to, to consolidate this view, uh, especially in regard with the new regulation. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was really interesting to hear here. So. So, and and uh, I understood that now in the end that uh, that also the, the uh, other uh, European countries would be will welcome to to participate and comment comment on the on the document development, and I, I guess you are you mentioned briefly the Gaia XO, so you are also synchronizing somehow with with that development. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. the Gaia X um, helps us to connect with the member states, right? Okay. Because there will be these different hubs, so that's easy to to reach out in this direction. But um, in terms of content-wise, I mean, we want to invite the, the the all also the whole European community. And as we have said, I mean, it it um it, you will be able to download it, read it, and provide content. And don't be surprised if you recover content parts which are familiar, because it's, we are not reinventing the wheel, but we want to build upon what the work which has been done the last the last years. Yeah, yeah, and so certainly the the trustworthiness of AI and and as well as data is very important uh, exactly. in order to to make the whole thing actionable. So towards the data spaces, yes, very good. So, Ed, Ed, do you have anything to add on at this point of time? No, I think it was a very nice, uh, very nice presentation, and I can see a lot of connections, um, enabling connections between both, and, and and a lot of requirements coming from trustworthy AI that will actually require much more control over how data is collected and managed in a data space. So I, I can see that there's there's a lot of discussion to be had there to figure out how best to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. So I think we could then go forward. Thank you very much, Julian and Sonia for that. Thank you so much. Talk and and uh, let's go Thank you. <laughs> to, towards the the Uh, this um, uh, Natalie Bertels, uh, and uh, we will hear about governance and legal infrastructure. So I think the podium is yours now. Thank you very much, Atomo, for the introduction. Can you see my slides? Yes. Are they in presentation mode? No. Uh, now they are, I see. Okay, all clear. Okay. This is good. It's good? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity uh, to position the legal and the ethical aspects in this uh, discussion. So in the objectives of data spaces for industrial AI. So it has come to the table. Okay. I can't switch between my slides. Sorry for this. I'll try again. So it has come to the table multiple times uh, that data is not regulated as an asset in its own right. So data is legally not considered as property. So this does not mean that there is no regulation that relates to data, far from, as you can see on my slide. So there is here the data that impacts data either from its indirect regulation or from the regulation of activities related to data. And I didn't mention on the slide, but like the proposed AI regulation, for instance, also has in its article 10, 
quality requirements with regards to data and data governance. So it says that in high risk AI systems and especially involving training of models, you have certain quality requirements with regards to data and data governance. I also didn't put in the circle here the upcoming data act, but which is sure also to have a big impact. So we have here many different uh, legal and ethical frameworks that have an impact. Many of them existed prior to the discussion about data spaces and data economy. And they're very different, different as, we, as to which their policy objectives, different as to how they uh, identify the rights holders, how they identify the rights debtors, and they have a very context specific dimension. So it means that this combination of frameworks, this can also vary according to the contextual setting. This of course creates a complicated situation and it's important we've had them in the past and it's important to also continue them in the future discussions with community stakeholders. So discussions with uh, industry, research, civil society, policymakers about the challenges that are encountered with regards to these legal and ethical frameworks. I've put here a few. So uh, we've had concerns clustered around scalability. Is it really possible to have a one size fits all solution? Um, difficulties around operationalization of concrete uh, legal and ethical frameworks. So still GDPR is posing problems here, but of course in the, in the frame of uh, the topic we are uh, presenting today, also trustworthiness, like is there a specific, um, a specific meaning of trustworthiness in an industrial AI setting that could be different? Uh, also concerns around the reconciliation of different legal and ethical frameworks, how to balance conflicting rights. And the complexity, of course, the complexity with regards to actors, data types, data transactions, business models, etc. So we're actually looking to strike the right balance between data control and data access. And now we want to make sure that all the legal obligations we foresee and that they are respected in all stages and that the law can actually have an enabling role to reach the societal and the economic objectives. So what are these next steps? next steps uh, to help us strike the right balance. In these next steps, I want to present them at three levels. So the first level we call legal infrastructure, the second level concerns data governance, and the third level is the governance of data spaces. So on the first level, what do we need to do? I already put a spoiler alert in the previous slide. So we move from the legal and ethical frameworks, this patchwork, towards the legal infrastructure for data spaces. What is required? We need to collaborate to work towards a robust conceptual framework. And I know I realize that uh, my slide here is very text heavy. There's a lot of issues that need to be tackled, but I think what the most important thing is to really focus on the interaction between the legal frameworks. There is horizontal versus specific regulation. It needs to be agile to actually assess and evaluate on the one hand and actually on the other hand, also cater for new legislation and increasing complexity. So with this robust conceptual framework, it's also important to connect this to the contractual framework. And here we need to be well aware of things that there are different degrees of control, that there are third party rights, dynamic aspects of data and also of IP scenarios. So you know when data is in the data space, it's possible that it's combined, it's possible that it changes uh, qualification. Same with IP scenarios, it's very important that we're actually able to cater for these in a combined approach between the conceptual framework and the contractual framework. An important element here is also the interplay between legal and technical architecture. So there are legal components with regards to standards and interoperability. And of course, we also need to be able to identify the technical implementation of this framework and of the contracts. So it's really important in the uh, data architectures that we develop to actually be able to have entry points for the legal, that we're able to, at the right moment in time, flag legal issues and go back to our conceptual framework to look for the solutions implemented and supported by the contractual framework. And here I mentioned the importance of soft law, of industrial agreement. And already here, there's been a lot, of, um, a lot of good developments and a lot of very valuable results 
from projects and from tenders, etc. So here, this is really important that we take all these developments into account. Um, a next element, as I already highlighted on data governance. So I think while originally it's mainly technical, this meaning of data governance has grown in scope over time. So there's no real consensual definition, although it's actually very broadly used, the expression. Uh, from the legal perspective, I think a very broad definition uh, we could use as a working definition is that it is a system of rights and responsibilities that determine who can take what actions with what data. So I think in this uh, topic, in this scope, it's very important for us, an important challenge uh, for us to actually facilitate the creation of best practices of sectorial cases of data governance mechanisms. So here we, for instance, look at data pools, um, data commons, data trusts, data federations, data altruism, data cooperatives, data marketplace, there are lots of them. So I think it's really important that we actually have uh, an experimental approach to identify which are the factors for success, which are the factors for failure. And I think based on this, we could draw lessons also for future regulation. And in connection, it was already mentioned by Julia and by Sonia, also here, test beds and sandboxes could be a means to actually gain more insights as to what are the concrete needs of stakeholders and could help solve this tension. Another important component is of course, um, the data intermediation landscape. This landscape um, at a current stage is still in its infancy. So it's really important for us to actually uh, map the emerging data intermediation models. So centralized, decentralized, we should not um, allow for them to be channeled into a given direction. And I think it's important that we allow them to actually emerge um, whether they are more collaborative, whether they are centralized or more collaborative and decentralized in line with the data space objectives. Of course, our overarching um, objective is that we look for ways to empower the data holders and with data holders, it could be legal entities, could be individuals. We're looking for ways, uh, different ways to empower them. Uh, here, of course, the data control paradigm is important, uh, the concept of data sovereignty, but we should definitely also engage in topics like the commodification of personal data and what about uh, co-generated data scenarios. So it should always be our aim to ensure a human-centric and a fair approach. A last component here I would like to highlight is that the data spaces, they have different underlying objectives and these could really impact data governance. So not all data spaces have a data market. Um, uh, well, th there's more um, to the data spaces than the data market perspective. So there are other uh, components that have a severe impact on data governance. So these scenarios should be identified and analyzed. And here also, I, I repeat the importance of soft law. And the last topic I would like to address together with you uh, concerns the governance of data spaces and actually more specifically the legal and the ethical aspects here because none, none of my, uh, with none of my slides, I mean to say that um, these topics are solely legal and solely ethical. Of course, they are interdisciplinary and they have a multitude of layers, but they also have a legal and ethical layer. So here, uh, with regards to governance of data spaces, it's important to actually look at the approach, how to institutionalize them, if at all, huh? uh, who are the actors, the importance of co-designing this governance, uh, an important aspect also of evolutionary compliance. Of course, we must be able to cater for changing regulations, what could be the impact of the Data Act, etc. Another important element here to mention is the interaction of cross, across data spaces and enforcement as an, of course, um, from a legal side, always an important element. So I, I took you in a bird's view uh, across the different uh, components we feel are important, the different layers uh, to discuss while um, yeah, positioning the legal and the ethical aspects in this discussion. 
Uh, I don't know where I am at timing. I hope I'm doing well. I hope uh, there is sufficient time left for questions. I'm ready to engage with you on them. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please uh, engage with the activities of the BDBA Task Force 5 on policy and societal issues and the Task Force 10 on data spaces. And I, I am a big thank you uh, to our Kiel Leuven team. I mentioned a few of our projects here and more information can be found on our website. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Natalie. Very uh, clear, clear and solid presentation. And, and uh, at this point of time, I would encourage also the audience to, to write, write uh, questions to the, to the questions answers box. So, so you can read them and, and try, try to then fit them into, into the, the, the discussion. So, uh, so Natalie, there's this, there could be still some time for, for question if, if there is any, Ed, can you see that or? Maybe not. Okay, so so this clearly is is a sort of like a, a long term process for for Europe that uh, we are at the same time trying to uh, figure out what the data spaces are and uh, what what kind of technologies there are and uh, this legal side is a uh, is um, also another issue and we all, in in our paper we did identify this this that. Uh, that uh, you know, adapt, ad, adapting the GDPR has been has been taking time. So, uh, what, what is your take on that? Uh, that uh, how do you see that? Uh, what kind of laws we te technocrats should, should look at, and and at what what time, and 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 what what is what, what is the the best approach to to work on that? Yeah, I think indeed it, um, it requires really attention to look at the interaction of the different legal frameworks. So you, you did mention rightfully GDPR, of course, personal data and the protection of personal data remains an important component. But aside from that, we have different data types. We have mixed data types in data spaces. So as I mentioned on one of the first slides, there is different legal frameworks with an impact and I think it's really important to analyze uh, or to analyze the interaction between those different legal frameworks. So to avoid um, that there is conflicting um, conflicting obligations, which of course cause confusion and legal uncertainty, and to then I then do a gap analysis and to see where indeed there is still opportunities for law to facilitate this combination of economic and societal objectives. So this legal infrastructure that we are proposing should actually be the answer. So it should actually also uh, be designed in order to interact with the technical infrastructure and the data architectures that are being developed for the data spaces. So that there is an easier, it lowers the barriers of connecting the both, uh, the both aspects actually, that there is an interaction between them. And timing wise, I think this is a continuous exercise um, it is something that needs to be monitored and evaluated. Um, and there is indeed a lot of uh, policy developments, which is, which is very good. Huh? So this, this, this should all be taken into account. Um, uh, but this, of course, um, yeah, sets the agenda for us uh, to work on this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is the, the European approach to, to data sharing and data spaces and, yes. and exploiting AI. Yeah, very yeah. good. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I will very... check other questions if they pop up in the chat or in the Uva. Okay. I will answer them in there. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Natalia. Thank you. Thank you. And next, I, I think we can continue. Uh, yeah, that's good. Uh, the questions are popping up. We can come back in the in the end to them. So yeah. So uh, let's go forward and and uh, look at the, the next uh, speaker, who is Antonio Kung and uh, Rigo Wenning who will be talking about interoperability. So welcome to the podium, Antonio and Rico. So I just lost my screen. Now you should see me. Um, we can see your slide. Yeah, we, you can see my slides. Um, so, so the first slide is just a hint 
uh, that tomorrow uh, um, uh, Ray Wolf will talk about data governance and standards mm -hmm. at 2 p.m. And we will have a dedicated workshop uh, on Thursday, 11.30 on metadata interoperability. And so uh, what we are talking about here today um, is, is just a teaser. And uh, uh, I, I just wanted to, to introduce you uh, to this, um, uh, to, to, to the issue. I think um, in the uh, presentation from Matt Curry, you saw already a lot of uh, what we are talking about uh, when we are talking about system of systems. Um, and uh, and, and I, I, I wanted to give you uh, some idea here um, because uh, the, what we are trying to build is, uh, uh, is, is, is little bricks that you can assemble together. It's uh, better than, than doing your own uh, bricks before you can uh, start building a house. So let's start. Um, what we saw is, uh, and, and metadata becomes more and more important, and I will come back to the uh, legal, constra uh, legal constraints, because for, for circular economy, for example, a digital twin, how does it look like to, to build a digital twin of this, uh, uh, of this uh, pocket lamp? Uh, maybe the pocket lamp has a QR code, and with the QR code, you can point into a, uh, into a knowledge graph, and the knowledge graph will tell you about all the components that this, um, uh, that this, uh, the, this pocket lamp has and, and, and how you, you deal with it and, and what information has, has it about. And this knowledge graph can go far beyond just the properties of a, of a thing uh, of, or sensors or what have you. It uh, uh, can concern regulatory information. So what's regulatory information? We just heard from Natalie uh, what regulatory, uh, regulatory information may mean. Uh, there are data protection constraints, commercial constraints in a data space. You may not only use this three times, blah, blah, blah. Environmental information, uh, you, you know, helper, helper texts. Everything is metadata that talks about my initial data that I want to process. And it tells me how to process it, uh, why to process it, uh, what not to do, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's very important information. And the problem is, we create more and more of that information and we create uh, more and more uh, things around us um, by the digitization uh, that create information and meta information industrial in industry 4.0 but think about smart cities and data protection uh, you we will not be able to make a smart city um, uh, uh, without uh, metadata uh, if we don't want to get rid of data protection. Smart vehicles, uh, if you want to share data among vehicles, you have to see who, who does what and so on. So the, the, the trouble is from the regulatory part and to the uh, data part, um, when we do all this by hand, we are drinking from the fire hose. So what Natalie tells you is all what we need. There is perhaps a legal procedure, but, but how would you do a legal procedure at five gigabytes a second if your uh, normal legal procedure already takes years? Um, so this is really an enabler, a central enabler. Metadata is a central enabler for those data space systems that we, are, uh, that we see. And we need to provide means of automation for this um, uh, for the for the bureaucratic environment and for the legal surroundings of all we do and without that automation we will not be able to do that and now how this this works it, how do you do that automation you talk about data and how do you talk about uh, data at uh, uh, said that this is uh, how do you do this is uh, um, you create uh, um, you use certain ontologies, linked data and, and stuff. And uh, uh, this way you can have building blocks and little pieces of uh, little bricks that you can put together um, uh, to assemble stuff. Uh, we, we, we need, and, and there I come 
uh, so so here I, I this is how this uh, um, how would you kind of create that knowledge graph that talks about this pocket lamp and what are the constraints and what are the formats that we use um, and there we are not there yet so there are large gaps in standardization for those especially in the area of vocabularies and ontology so what we need to make data travel from one data space to another is to have all the metadata available so that the other data space can ingest the data without actually having a huge overhead in manual adapt uh, adaptation uh, of the data and the data constraints or having complex contracts uh, covering a, a large variety of data. And to have those, the, the interoperability that we need to travel to, to make uh, um, data travel from data space to data space, um, we, we need certain elements. We need a computer readable link between the object, the data that we are talking and the metadata. Because if the metadata stands alone, it's, it's meaningless. It says um, the sun is shining, but it's not saying where. Um, we need metadata formats so that it's easy to export them and it's easy to ingest them in, in, in new and other uh, data spaces that use different technology. We need semantics, we need vocabularies, and we need meaning. And, and I, I recently learned that I have to distinguish between semantics and meaning because I need a couple of triples, a couple of things to create an actual meaning that is socially meaningful. And so there are two, two aspects to this. I'm, I'm the plumber down there and I'm, I'm putting pipes together or I'm creating pipes, but, but how to puzzle, the, puzzle those pieces together is, is not trivial, uh, uh, is not trivial uh, uh, at all. And how to do this, um, uh, this is um, uh, Antonio who will tell you, because I think uh, SE41 uh, um, builds more of, a, of an how to assemble all this. We are just making the bricks. Antonio. Thank you. So, hello everyone. Go to the next uh, slide. Can you go to the next slide, uh, Rigo? Yeah. Um, I have two slides. I want to show to you uh, what we try to achieve uh, at standardization when it comes to interoperability and when it comes to industrial AI. Okay. So this one is on interoperability. Interoperability is everywhere and SC41 has dedicated a working group. You can see here we have in SC41 four working groups, one on architecture, one on interoperability, one on applications, one on digital twins. They all are all important for industrial AI. And we have a good relationship with them because uh, the counterpart of BDVA, AIOTI, has a liaison. I'm the liaison officer. And Ray Walsh uh, for BDVA is the liaison officer of SC42. Okay? So we are well equipped uh, to make sure that uh, what we do can be standardized. Okay? One thing I want to say is, of course, we'll push the ideas in this community, but it's not uh, European. It's really worldwide. And actually, uh, Rigo is from the World Wide Web Consortium. It's also worldwide. What we think is really worldwide Right. Just let's just push what we have in mind, okay? So I just want to highlight uh, the activities we have. There are many things uh, that has to be solved, as Rigo said. So we are trying to solve them. So you can see that uh, there is one standard 21.8.23-3 semantic interoperability. I was one of the editors. It's going to be published this year. It explained a little bit the machinery that you have to build, the engineering machinery actually. Then there is a study of something more than semantic interoperability, so the behavioral interoperability. In semantic interoperability, you will try to explain what you exchange. In behavioral interoperability, you will try to explain what you do. Okay, so and this is the next step. Of course, they relate very much. Okay, then uh, we are create we have created actually in November a small task force on IoT data space architecture, and it's going to grow and hopefully uh, later on get to a standard. 
and I hope that the, ent the, the, the input from uh, EDSA, GAIA-X, uh, whatever comes from Europe uh, will be there. Okay, I will be in touch. I also want to highlight that there will be a presentation like by China on distributed processing of massive IoT data. That's gonna be the next week, okay. Go to the next slide. There you go. Yeah, and then uh, there are even more activities related to industry and industrial AI. So here you have the list of ad hoc group of advisory group for joint working group. Okay, so there are two liaisons, one with industrial IoT and one with utilities IoT. So this is really with uh, industry, industry, okay. Then uh, there are two joint uh, working groups with energy, one, one on, sorry, one on uh, TC65 in IEC, which is on industry control and automation, and the other one with IEC, six smart energy on energy. There are two working groups or ad hoc groups on IoT and digital twin use cases and IoT trustworthiness in probability study. Actually, I'm the convener of both. Okay, and um, when it comes to activities related to to, to, to AI, of, okay, so there are um, a number of IoT use cases that have been published, and some of them touch uh, upon uh, industrial AI. Okay, uh, there is a digital use case uh, standard underway. Okay, and I, I think uh, there will be at least two or three uh, use cases that are related to industrial AI. And uh, we are launching a digital twin architecture workshop. I'm the chair in September, 2021, and uh, members will be invited to participate. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you very much, uh, Vigo and, and Antonio. Very impressive. There are so, so many standardization efforts ongoing that it's, uh, it's really important to have this kind of uh, look over, over, looking over that uh, what, what is going on and, and, uh, and uh, to know that uh, I can see that you are the central, central people in here. So the data spaces in order to happen need uh, 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 standardization very much and, and the interoperability is an essential issue. So I, I think we should go further. I, we, we are uh, a little bit behind schedule, but the, if we have time, we'll, we'll take the, the questions. You can recall, there's a question in, for you in the, in the chat, I can see, but uh, they, then you, again, you can take, take on to that but, uh, there. Let, let's see. Thank you very much, uh, Rigo and, and Antonio. Mm. Okay, very good. More questions. So the next uh, uh, in the in the agenda is is uh, uh, data spaces for manufacturing. An example of a vertical. And then uh, Matthias, uh, are you online, Matthias Quam? Yes. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon, uh, Matthias Kuhm, European Commission Digital Connect. I um, uh, will talk about uh, manufacturing data space, uh, one data space um, in our uh, data strategy as an example. And um, you know the data strategy, um, but I uh, <laughs> just want um, to uh, remind you that um, it's uh, important from our view that we have uh, the different pillars uh, here addressed and not only the rollout of these um, data spaces, uh, but that we also have the governance part. Um, we also um, have the skills development um, um, and, um, <clears throat> of course, also this um, infrastructure component uh, with um, which the cloud one will, we want them um, to develop further to the edge paradigm. Um, and, uh, well, Natalie has already described very good um, the different aspects um, that are relevant from a legal or governance uh, perspective. Um, these are the different elements <clears throat> we are preparing um, to support um, these uh, governance to uh, enhance the trustworthiness and the fairness um, in these um, data spaces. But I will now go into the call that we are preparing for the Digital Euro program, which is an investment strategy uh, really um, 
capacity building program um, <clears throat> that's uh, not comparable to Ryzen. Um, it's uh, not a research program. It's wants to really roll out um, different solutions um, with artificial intelligence. And um, the main pillar from my point of view is the one on artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, here we on the one hand uh, have horizontal actions um, <clears throat> and uh, the AI on demand platform, but we also have this uh, different um, data spaces, which we think uh, lay the foundation then for the AI development um, that we want um, to support. And <clears throat> This is a more schematic view on how we see these different layers from the infrastructure layer up to the data spaces. <clears throat> and the data spaces, from our point of view, not only the technical solution kind of a platform, but a very important aspect of such a data space is also the soft infrastructure with the data governance and <clears throat> the tools that are necessary to really make this data governance happen. And um, <clears throat> if I then come to the manufacturing data spaces um, here, we <clears throat> wanted to promote this uh, cross-organizational data sharing. And uh, from our point of view, um, we need therefore, of course, technical tools and infrastructures. Um, we have developed some of them already in Horizon 2020, but uh, if these are the necessary 20% that is already there, the main effort will be in the development of the right governance mechanisms. This is, this is really what we think uh, is um, the key challenge uh, to come to oper operational data spaces. And um, we are preparing um, three different aspects now for the Digital Year program. We uh, have um, two use cases um, that we want um, to see projects on. And we also have um, this um, horizontal view on uh, how this um, data sharing um, supports also um, circularity um, aspects. Um, <clears throat> Isa, as it was already mentioned, um, that the digital twin then describes uh, what are the components and materials that are within the project, uh, or also that you have data from the usage phase of a project uh, product that can be used then uh, for the recycling and maybe also remanufacturing of a product. The main um, two. Um, aspects within this manufacturing data space call will be um, two scenarios. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we expect two different um, consortia, one that focuses on this um, supply chain uh, management um, and uh, how this uh, can be <coughs> improved and uh, be done more agile, more continuously with uh, more AI in it. Um, and then we also have this uh, predictive maintenance asset management um, um, scenario where we want uh, to see especially how um, the addition of um, ad um, um, additional actors uh, can really improve this already very mature topic. So if I compare these two different use cases, the supply chain management um, use case, uh, uh, there the participants normally already have a lot of experience in exchanging data among them, uh, but here we want to see really improvement in these uh, AI applications that bring a bit more of the predictive aspects um, into this um, supply chain management so that you uh, easily uh, can, can see the hurdles and reconfigure your supply chain if necessary. Um, here we think uh, we can uh, still have some, some improvements. Um, while on the other hand, for this uh, asset management and predictive maintenance part, it's from our point more important to really bring new players to the table that uh, develop uh, <coughs> new kinds um, of um, algorithms um, to um, also make use of, of new sensors and new data formats um, that uh, really can uh, bring this topic beyond what's already developed from the machine tool providers and the machine tool users currently. And um, if we then see how this all fits together in one big picture. I have here described uh, once again, 
the different elements we see in the digital Europe program. And uh, on the top, we have um, these um, European Digital Innovation Hubs initiative that mainly addresses uh, SMEs and the public sector. And we think they are also an important um, tool to bring in um, SMEs um, that have uh, new ideas, uh, what can be done with the data that we will want to make available with these uh, manufacturing data spaces. And uh, the main messages, and uh, with this um, I want to conclude, is um, that we really come from um, data analytics for efficiency, because currently a lot is done uh, to increase efficiency, really to new value creation models. That, that was what we want to to see with um, the new program, that's what we want to support with this new program. And um, of course, we need to first um, have um, the technical developments, um, but here we see that uh, there are many building blocks that can be built upon. Um, the main focus of these uh, projects that one, we want to start with the call that hopefully will open uh, in November are uh, these um, additional <coughs> new value creation models uh, that uh, we have. Some of them already described in a series of workshops we had. Um, this is just a reference. Um, you can uh, look them up afterwards. Um, there we have already identified some of uh, these embryonic data spaces that we want uh, as our uh, starting point uh, for our endeavor. And uh, well, with this, um, I already want um, to finish and I think it's best um, to discuss this then um, in the discussion we will have now. Uh, yeah, with this, back to Tuomo, thank you. Thank you so much, Matthias. Very excellent presentation about forth forthcoming opportunities, all also that what, what we can do. Uh, and and uh, what we can think of, think about, and uh, uh, obviously this this uh, manufacturing data space is is something something to to take a look at. But I, now now I, I think it's it's about time to to a little bit uh, reflect on on what what we have been hearing. That, uh, that I, I think when when listening to that, that this. Uh, you know, the pre uh, great presentations here is that uh, really, we really have a many faceted uh, uh, phenomena, in, uh, phenomena in, in our hands and, and uh, uh, looking at the, the many use cases and, 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 uh, and thinking about uh, the, this uh, interoperability and trustworthiness and, and uh, legal issues and, and then implementation. So, so apparently there is, there is quite a lot of... Uh, well, in the work to do and, and uh, think about that how to how to uh, really make make the roadmap and make the, the uh, this this uh, data space development ac actionable. In a sense, we have been thinking and in, in in the task force that, that we should be looking at the at the design aspects and, and design is always a very broad issue as as itself also, and and. Uh, and uh, also this trustworthy uh, AI, AI and, and data spaces is one, one thing that we have been thinking of. But then again, I would like to ask at, at least, uh, I know what Matthias would say that it, we, we need to do these data spaces. And this is very, very, very important. But uh, starting from, from, the, 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 from the, the beginning, that what would be the, the, the first action action that uh, the, the, if you should choose one one action that we we should be doing in order to 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 build uh, like european govern data sharing space so so what what would that be or can can that be even even <laughs> chosen yeah Matthias, please. yeah well <clears throat> the first um, action um, is um, to um, start with a use case um, we have um, presented here some 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 ideas um, this uh, <clears throat> are the use cases we think um, that um, are the most relevant maybe currently in the discussion. Um, but uh, to start with the use case, then collect uh, different actors that um, discuss then along these use cases, uh, how they intend uh, to uh, use the data, how they intend to share the value of the data and um, 
then uh, also with uh, um, in relation to the Data Governance Act, um, how uh, they see the governance model if they uh, need to have uh, an intermediary that's uh, completely neutral or if they have more uh, <coughs> kind of um, shared um, governance um, structure as uh, also Natalie has um, described. And um, we see different uh, fora where such discussions already happen. We see this, for example, in GaiaX, we have uh, different uh, of these use case groups. Uh, we see the data sharing coalition in the Netherlands and so on. And these, these are starting points because much time will go into this this discussion um, what what are, are the, the, the rules and obligations and and, and the expectations uh, each of the participants will have before then these uh, data spaces will really come to action mm -hmm. that would be my the first step <laughs> thank you very much matthias then maybe we'll go let's start with uh, then then go forward with it and and if you think me as a genie here asking that you so one thing that you, you you would wish for so what what kind of action that would be can i start uh, actually i want to oh, just to please okay so uh I was surprised by how Matthias expressed it, and he started by uh, use cases, but he ended up with governance. And my answer was, yes, the governance is the first uh, priority. And the reason is because, uh, but it, it agrees exactly to what Matthias mentioned, okay? And of course, the use cases will tell us what it is we have to protect or what it is uh, we have to ensure for governance, okay? And I would call it governance and empowerment. And actually it relates, of course, to the central uh, wheel of trust, okay? Uh, because you only trust if you know that uh, something good will happen. And of course you need to have governance and empowerment, okay? And one thing I wanna say, sorry to get back to standardization, I didn't mention SC27, which is on security, privacy and the like, but I, I have identified about uh, 25 uh, standards, which all relate to this problem. Okay, so uh, if we uh, provide, say, governance is a priority, then I'm sure that we look at all the standards we are working on in security, privacy, ethics, and the like, and make sure that they integrate well, because of course they all have a needs, but we need to integrate them. Okay, so uh, the governance is across, it's following the data lifecycle, so it's across all organization in the data space. So this is a super complicated challenge that we all need to solve. Yeah. Thank you very much, Antonio. Any takers from there? Yes. Yeah, I started with a just to add, but uh, I fully agree with Antonia. I only started with the use cases because I think we first to have uh, need to have a small group uh, to 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 start a discussion. That that's the reason to start with use cases. Otherwise, I fully agree. Okay. If, if I could add something just just to the uh, the use case versus the governance model, um, so, so obviously they're, they're both they're both correct, um, and, and I think one of the first things we need to do is maybe to look to look at the eco the business ecosystems that exist currently, where, where data is being shared, but maybe the scale of the sharing isn't as much as we'd like. Um, so so you, what you have is you have these ecosystems, you have, you, have, you have the business connections there, they trust each other, they want to work with each other. So, so a, a lot of the barriers are removed. So, so I think these could be good places to start because what we're trying to do is to, to, to scale the level of data sharing that's happening. And, and, and that, that's a little bit to, to pointing at the use cases. What are the ones, what are the quick win use cases that we can have that are actually already within a governance model or a collaboration model that's already working for these businesses? And I think a good example of this is uh, is Airbus, where, where their Skywise platform is is looking at an existing business ecosystem and trying to scale the data sharing. And I think that that's that, that that's the first quick quick wins that we can try to identify. Um, once we have that, then we can figure out well, how do we start creating new value chains, bringing in new actors, or leveraging the the best practices that we've identified there to help other ecosystems that maybe aren't as mature in terms of of their data sharing. Um, and from a research point of view, what I think is really interesting is how do we start getting AI to help us more with the data sharing process? So rather than just having data for AI, but AI for data, how do we start leveraging more intelligent techniques to understand the data that maybe removes some of the barriers around semantics, around meaning, to, to get again, make it easier to share data. So again, that's, I'm a researcher, so, so, so 
that that's the uh, the research and innovation topics for me. Okay, thank you very much, Ed. Um, yeah, just uh, to to add on that, um, I think one of the the things if you if you talk about Airbus, they they are a big platform. Siemens is a, is a big company. They can create an ecosystem where smaller actors uh, join. But as soon as you are not having a big ship and and the European landscape uh, of of businesses is a landscape of small businesses. So to band together with 10, 15 small businesses to kind of compete with the bigger ones or Chinese, um, the Chinese uh, uh, state business, um, there you need interoperability and this interoperability needs to go beyond, um, beyond the data or the sharing. It needs to, to be uh, meaningful building blocks that they can reassemble as they wish. That means if we are just creating one cathedral where people can go into the cathedral, then it will serve one purpose, which is cathedral. But if we give them bricks, they can build cathedrals and houses. And that's, I think, the challenge that this is, but this is, uh, um, this is a legal challenge as well as a technology challenge. If the legal guys come with the cathedral, you can use any technology you want in the world, you will not achieve anything. If you get the legal guys to abandon their cathedral and, and, and give you building blocks that you can combine, like snippets of a contract or clauses in a contract, in, 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 in contractual clauses, and you can represent those in technology, then you can, you can start having an agile system. So it needs both parts. It needs the, that, that's the real challenge here is, is the combination of legal knowledge and talk, technology knowledge. Because if you have everyone in their corner, uh, the, the legal guys making their ethical cathedral and uh, uh, the others are doing their super data sharing thing, they will, they will come at some point in time trying to match and will make boom. And then we all use Google. Yeah, that was really good notion. Thank you very, very much for that, Rigo. So we still have a couple of minutes. Any takers on that? So we need to work in synchronization and uh, to build a snowball and mm -hmm. uh, to integrate the things at the same time. Okay, so we must not wait at the end, as Rico said. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think we need indeed the modularity that Rigo mentioned, but as well to have them um, connected. This conceptual framework is not a, con a cathedral. It is how the building blocks can be connected and how they relate to each other. So it's actually to then have them modularly applicable, but still uh, see the impact that they have and the connections they have. So that this is yeah, clear, it's visible. Mm -hmm. But but so far the, the, the technicians so far the technicians uh, uh, weren't able to tell me how to connect those things. They can't. We in, in legal we can easily we can connect those things. They can't for the moment. Mm -hmm. And this is this is where we are back in research. Yes. So so I very still, much nevertheless it needs to happen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sonia, you, you. I just wanted to highlight, I very much agree with Ed's comments that we should um, um, make use or benefit from existing um, business ecosystems because all um, these activities in terms of ensuring that data can be shared efficiently, if you do it for the first time, the costs are probably higher than the benefit. So um, the recommendation is be close to business so that the value can be seen immediately. The more often you share it, then the more benefit you get, but the initial costs are quite high. Um, this is, when mm -hmm. thinking about reusable AI comp 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 components, the same thing. So for that reason, in order to ensure that you have sufficient support from business, um, the recommendation is always to stay close to business opportunities and value um, to, to create this momentum. Mm -hmm. All right. 
very good, very very good notions. I, I must say that uh, and, uh, now now hoping that we are not building a cathedral here, so so that we can we can create a snowball. That that's what I got. So so that that gradually and together to look at that what what is under work and and. Uh, it's it's a tremendous effort, I must say. Then understanding this this and, and then again, if, if bringing in the artificial intelligence and, and knowing that there are a lot of opportunities in in, in combining this, and, and I, I think that we are really on on the right track on on this this the, with this development. So so uh, I think uh, it's about time to to thank you all. And, and uh, for, for the uh, splendid presentations and uh, excellent discussion. And, and uh, maybe, Ed, do you want to say something also from your part or how? Just to thank everybody. I think it was a fantastic and interesting conversation that, that showed the complexity of, of the challenges that we have, but also the richness of the skills that we have in Europe as well. And the, I think it's it a great way to start off, uh, off Data Week after those high level talks. Uh, this morning. So, so th thank, thank you all very much for your time. Thank you all very much for your insights um, and, and looking forward to continuing the conversation. Okay. Okay. Thanks thank you so much. Yes. Thanks a lot. See you later. Yeah. Bye bye.